Nina, and thank you, Nev. Uh, well, this Easter, we've been thinking about Easter eggs. Uh, not the kind you eat, but the kind you find in movies. Uh, an Easter egg in the movies is uh, a surprise that's been hidden by the director, something uh, to help you sit up and pay attention, something to look for and search for. And when you find them, they're always exciting. Uh, over the last few services, I've been showing some of the Easter eggs in the Indiana Jones films. Um, they're always hidden Star Wars references. And um, they're not always very hidden. Uh, this one in uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you have Club Obi-Wan. Um, not very hidden at all. Um, has anybody seen the new Indiana Jones, by the way, The Dial of Destiny? One person? That's oh, two, three. Um, uh, apparently, there are 31 Easter eggs in it, according to one website. I have not seen the film. Uh, I'll leave it to you to go and watch it and find them. I think I like the Easter eggs that are a little bit more hidden. Um, and so this one... Uh, it's one of those ones that kind of, a, it sneaks up on you. It's a bit of a slow burn, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so it's here in Toy Story. Apparently, all three Toy Story movies have references to The Shining um, from carpets to TV. Down the bottom there, you have that iconic scene of the little boy riding his tricycle down the hallway in the, in the hotel where the murders happen. Notice the carpet, exactly the same as what Woody and Buzz are walking on. Uh, this is the next door neighbor, the naughty kid's house. And they're trying to run away from the, the, the little boy who destroys toys. So he's the killer from The Shining. There you go. The psycho kid. There you go. I chose this theme of Easter eggs because uh, I think the Easter stories in the Bible contain Easter eggs as well. There are hidden surprises for those who are looking. Uh, hidden surprises that make us sit up and pay attention. And our Easter egg today is a little bit like the, the, the Shining reference in Toy Story. Uh, it's subtle a little bit invisible at first, but then once you see it, you recognize it immediately. And so uh, keep your eyes open as we go through the text. And uh, if you don't get it, I'll work it out for you. I'll let you know. But for now, why don't we pray that God would speak to us as we open his word. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we know that the Bible is your word and that you speak to us through it. Would you speak to us now as we come to this part of the Bible that we know so well? Would you reveal to us the miracle of the resurrection? And we pray this in the power of the risen Christ. Amen. Well, uh, it is so good to have you in church this morning. We said it before, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Uh, it's more than just something we say in church on Easter Sunday. You see, if the resurrection is true, then our whole outlook on life and death and eternity needs to change. Uh, because we, we all know that old adage, there's only two constants in life death and taxes and our experience of life tells us that one day it will all end it always ends in death and in dying there's the grave and a funeral and tears and loss and grief and that's our experience of this world 100% of us will succumb to that seemingly unstoppable enemy and force which is death and that was Mary Magdalene's experience too um, gospel writers Mark and Luke tell us that Mary went to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday with spices to anoint the body of Jesus. She assumed he was dead. Uh, but look what happens when she gets to his tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. See, Mary expects to find a body in the tomb, doesn't she? And when it's not there, she thinks somebody must have taken Jesus' body, maybe stolen it or put it somewhere different. Because that's the only logical explanation, isn't it? There's no body, it must have been taken. And if you put yourself in Mary's shoes for a moment, do you think you would have come to the same logical conclusion? See, what would you think? Uh, you need to see the body, don't you, to know conclusively what happened. Well, Peter and uh, the other disciple were also there that morning. And um, the other disciple is John, by the way, the loved one. Um, he never refers to himself as John. He, he always makes it in person. It's a bit like Terry from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. You know, Terry loves yogurt. Terry loves love. Never talks about himself with his own name. Anyway, John and Peter, they meet Mary along the way, and she says the body's missing. John gets to the tomb first, uh, but he doesn't go in. It's quite interesting. He describes their foot race. He outran Peter. Um, gives it a ring of truth, though, doesn't it? Uh, he remembers it exactly as it happens. And Peter goes in, and Peter saw the strips of linen lying there, 
as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, that's John, finally, John, who'd reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. So what did they see when they went in there? Well, Peter and John saw exactly what Mary saw. Uh, They saw a mostly empty tomb, except for the linen cloths that Jesus' body had been wrapped in. What they didn't see was a body. They didn't see a body, did they? And you could probably argue that um, this empty tomb is evidence of a resurrection. Um, After all, Jesus was really dead on the cross uh, on the Friday. Um, He had died. They'd been verified by the Roman soldiers who pierced his side with a spear. He'd been buried in this uh, tomb. Tomb had been blocked up by a massive stone. There were Roman soldiers guarding it. Um, to prevent anybody interfering with the body. And now the guards are gone and this boulder has been rolled away and, and the body is nowhere to see, only the cloths that it was wrapped in. So is this evidence of a resurrection? Is it evidence of a resurrection? Well, it's definitely evidence of something, um, something surprising and something unexpected, but is it evidence of a resurrection? Um, because three people see the tomb that morning and uh, what do they make of it? Well, Mary assumes that somebody has taken the body. Uh, Peter looks in, he sees the linen, verse 6, and he says nothing. And then John says, he saw and believed. Again, I I wonder what John saw and believed. I I think he believed that Jesus had been resurrected. After all, Jesus had talked about leaving and going to the Father and then coming back. It was back in chapter 16. Uh, John might have seen the empty tomb and believed in the resurrection. Uh, 20 verse 9, though, the verse after this tells us that He still didn't understand from the scripture that the Christ had to be risen from the dead. That would come later. I think I'm a bit more of a Mary. I think I would have looked around and said, well, the body's gone. We just can't be sure. We don't know where he is. He's just not here. And I think that's the key to the resurrection story, isn't it? Without the body, you can't know conclusively what happened, can you? And so look at 20 verse 10 and see where the empty tomb leaves our character. The disciples went back to where they were staying. It's a little bit of an anticlimax. They just went home. And we find Mary standing outside the tomb crying. And I think this is where the story gets interesting. Uh, Because as Mary wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white and they were seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Just stop for a moment. These are angels Um, Most people fall down in abject terror. Um, Angels, by the way, they're God's messengers. Um, Normally, they bring a message. Uh, This time, they don't have a message. They have a question, why are you crying? And Mary says, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. Um, And you kind of have to ask yourself, why don't these messengers, these angels, have a message from Mary? Well, the answer is, the message was standing right behind her. Um, At this, she turns around And she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And Jesus asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? You ever had one of those moments where everybody else seems to be in on the joke, but you don't know it? Um, You're not sure what's going on? And when I was at university, I um, had this particularly, I studied French, and I had this particularly dreary French lecturer, and uh, it was a really small class, it was probably 12 or 14 of us, and uh, this one day, I had fallen asleep in class. No judgments, people. Um, I'd fallen asleep in class, and uh, anyway, I remember waking up, I'm still sitting up in my chair, but you get that feeling that everybody's looking at you. Uh, even the teacher was looking at me, and so I sat really still and very cool as if I hadn't been asleep. I was just, you know, closing my eyes for 20 minutes. Um, uh, anyway, after a few seconds, this teacher says to me in French, she says, Daniel, my wife wants me to do this in French, so I'm going to do it. He says, Daniel, on se moque de vous. We're, we're laughing at you um, because you're asleep. And he says, there's something on your head. <laughs> and I reach up and there's this paper hat on my head <laughs> that somebody's put there. <laughs> well, the angels and Jesus, they both ask Mary, why are you crying? And they know there's, something to, uh, there's nothing to cry about, sorry, but not Mary. She still hasn't cottoned on. She thinks that Jesus is the gardener. And she says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'm going to go and get him. She still doesn't get it. And Jesus ends the charade with a single word. Jesus says to her, Mary. 
With one word, she knew that it was him. Everything changed. She clicked. See, this was the voice of the good shepherd, the one who calls his sheep by name, and his sheep know his voice. He calls her Mary. She hears her name, and she knows her Lord. This is the same voice of the one who has called creation into being with his very words. Back in John chapter 1, it said he was there with God at the beginning. And now Jesus is recreating the world with words in a way that will make death no longer have the last laugh. Jesus says to her, Mary. And Mary turns towards Jesus and she says in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And it's that moment where everything becomes clear, isn't it? She sees the body, but it isn't dead. The body is there, but it's not dead, it's alive. And so Mary's tears of sorrow, they are forgotten. She sees with her own eyes that Jesus, her beloved teacher, is alive and standing there right in front of her. And she grabs onto him and she never wants to let him go in this embrace that is very, very, so, so human, I think. You know, in the face of grief, you just, you just want to reach out and hold on to somebody. And so she embraces him in what this sort of very primal or maternal kind of hug. And, and it's a hug that makes everything feel better. The hug you need and the hug that tells you that everything's going to be okay. See, Jesus was really dead. And now Jesus is really alive. Um, sometimes it's not so bad to be a Mary, is it? She had a great experience that day. Uh, now, I promised an Easter egg. Um, well, I think Jesus turning up in disguise is a pretty good Easter egg. Um, he's there, he gets the little cameo. Uh, he's also the star of the movie. Um, we get to be in on the surprise, like we're on the outside looking in. Uh, but I think the real Easter egg is this. It's hidden in Jesus' question to Mary. When he says, who is it you're looking for? Who is it you're looking for? See, I think Jesus asks us the same question today. Who is it that you're looking for? When you came to church this morning, who were you looking for? What were you looking for? What were you expecting to find when you come to church this morning? See, I think some of us come to Easter. Uh, we come to the Easter story uh, knowing what we're looking for. We've come to Easter services before. We know the story about Jesus. We know the story about the empty tomb. We know all about the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, we know all of the historical facts. But that's the problem. Sometimes it feels like just history um, with no relevance to us today. And so we come to church looking for this historical Jesus who's kind of locked up in this historical textbook, the Bible. He's not a real person. He's kind of a character from history who's gone. And so we sort of come and learn about an aspect of history. Now, Jesus was a historical character, by the way. And uh, we've probably got more evidence for the resurrection than we have for most historical events that happened at that period of time. Uh, we take them as gospel truth, um, but it's a little bit harder for this one. See, Jesus was historical. And he's more, though. He's not just a historical figure. And the Bible is more than a history book. I think some other of us come to church looking for a different Jesus again. See, I think some of us are here with spices to anoint Jesus' body and to remember him and to revere him. But we see him as somebody who died 2,000 years ago and he's still dead. You know, his influence lives on, but he's gone. And so we come here to honor him and to, to revere him, but he belongs to the realm of the dead. Somebody we can't see any, anymore. And, and because you can't see the body, well, you can't really be sure what happened, can you? And I think this is particularly the case when, you know, our life might have been filled with grief. And perhaps some part of the, parts of your life have been amazing, but then there are other aspects where you've been filled with sadness or, or disappointment or loss. Maybe there are chapters of your life where you've, chapters of your life that have left you feeling dead inside or perhaps wishing it. And you wonder, where was Jesus in all of that? Why didn't he save? Why, why didn't he heal? Why isn't this getting any easier? See, those are hard questions and I don't have easy answers to them. But just because that's our experience of the world, it doesn't mean that Jesus is dead. It doesn't mean that Jesus is disinterested or it doesn't mean that Jesus is powerless. No, it's the very opposite. Look at verse 17 and what this passage says about Jesus. See, Jesus says to her, he says, Do not hold on to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. See, Jesus is not a historical character who belongs on the pages of a book. He's not one of the patriarchs buried in a tomb in Israel. Jesus is not dead. He's alive. 
and he's ascended to heaven to be with the Father, to be with his Father. And he says, his Father is our Father too, if we trust in him. His God is our God. See, Jesus is showing us that beyond the grave, we will return to life just like he did. There will be, uh, we'll be going, sorry, and we'll go to be with our Father and our God. We won't decay in a tomb, but we'll be alive forever. Uh, Billy Graham, that famous evangelist, once said, he said, someday you'll hear or read that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will have just changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. I shall be more alive than I am now. Isn't that a wonderful promise? That's what Jesus says to each of us. If we put our trust in him, he will give us eternal life, real physical bodies, the kind you can see, the kind you can hug, the kind you can hold on to. And that sadness of letting go those that we love, that won't happen in the new heavens and the new earth. See, Jesus has shown us what it looks like. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And one day, he'll return to take us there. One day, we'll hear his voice call our name. And on that day, you'll be more alive than you are now. Because Jesus wasn't in the tomb that first Easter Sunday morning, and death has lost its sting. And that's got to change the way that we see the world. Um, If you received a bulletin today, there probably weren't enough for everybody. I wrote a little bit of text in it that I'd love you to take home and to think about. It's from a sermon by a guy called Tony Reinke. Um, it, It helps us, I think, to see the world in a different way. Let me read it for you. He says, like children scattering around a yard for Easter eggs, you and I are on a hunt. Our thirsty souls rummage through every nook and cranny of this world in search of shiny pleasures and saccharine delights. And for every such joy seeker in in pursuit of treasures that will not fade or rust or break or be stolen, well, we must pay careful attention to Easter. Not with a nod off through the sermon kind of attention, but with real, earnest, eager attention riveted on Christ. If we miss the significance of the resurrection, we scamper past the greatest joy in the universe. See, God wants to bring resurrection to our lives today, not just in the future, but today. See, Jesus isn't the saviour of the dead, he's the saviour of the alive. He can change your life. All the vain things that uh, that charm us most, well, Jesus is better. All the sadness, Jesus can turn that to joy. What is lost, Jesus can recover. With great celebration, where there is hopelessness, Jesus brings hope. And you know what, brothers and sisters, even when death pursues us, Jesus assures us that we too will ascend to be with our Father in heaven if we trust in him. What does that look like in practice? Well, Come and see. Come and be part of what Jesus is doing as he resurrects us one by one. Places us in in a village of Robertson or Burrowang as he puts us in the highlands or he puts us wherever it is that you live. Come and see what God is doing as he brings resurrection through churches and through his people. As he brings healing and wholeness and forgiveness to communities. Come and find the risen Jesus. Because he's the real surprise of Easter. And you know what? One day, you'll meet him, just like Mary did. He'll call your name, and suddenly, all the doubts will vanish. See, Jesus is more alive today than he ever was. Are you ready to meet him? Let's pray. Our Father, Creator God, you breathe life into Adam and Eve, and you breathe life into our mortal bodies too. Help us to see and believe today that you can grant us life beyond death, just like you gave Jesus life beyond death. Help us to trust you for this, through Christ and in your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.